Good morning. Happy and another happy Saturday to each and every one of you out there. It is always our privilege to come to you this way as we share God's word, as we just prayerfully want to encourage you any way we can. And this is the best way that we can stay connected to you, reach out to you, let us know that we're thinking about you, always praying for you. And definitely looking forward to that time when we will see you face to face. We have uh, Josh. Josh today, he's looking into 2 Samuel 6, 1 through 15. We've got Wendy, a recorded message of her. So always a good thing. Always a good thing to look into God's word, to just praise him through song. And let's pray. Pray that God would truly open our hearts to receive what he has put on Josh's heart to communicate to you. Let's pray. Precious Lord, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, always your grace, always your love, your unconditional love, always, Lord, always your, your desire to just talk with you, walk with you, and be with you. We pray for this time together. We pray for the message that Josh has. We pray for Wendy and her song. But again, more that we're just taking it all in and... Um, applying it to our lives, being encouraged, um, and just, just thanking you, Lord, for all you do. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Here is Wendy. Sing with me. Jesus, we love you. Old things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains a cornerstone. Things that we thought were dead are breathing in life Shine on darkest nights For all that you've done We will pour out our love This will be our anthem song Jesus, we love you Oh, how we love you
Good morning, everybody. So happy that you are here. And I um, guess I'm going to start off this way. Have you ever heard the saying, anything worth having will cost you something? Like anything that actually has value, you know, to get it, it will, to obtain it, it'll cost you something. Even if it's something, you know, like a new pair of Jordans, right? It's going to cost you a lot of money or a car. Something like getting a job promotion is going to cost you hours. You know, you're going to have to put in those extra hours and put in hard work to get noticed. But have you ever wanted something that was great and you wanted to pursue it and you started pursuing it, but you did not know that it was going to cost as much as it did? Um, you know, you, you hear people say, man, that's really going to cost you a lot. And you're like, yeah, I mean, I've heard that, but I don't know if I believe it. Well, I had a situation like that happen to me in sports, and it was my 10th grade year in high school, so my, my second year of high school, and it was in football, um, and at the end of my ninth grade season, I moved up to the varsity, so it was no longer JV, it was on varsity, but my 10th grade year was my first full year of varsity sports at any level. That meant, you know, having an off season, and my older brother was four years older than me, and, and his class was the last of this set of classes that had just won championships over and over and over. Like our, They were district champions for something like five or seven years in a row. And his senior class, they, they had a lot of seniors. So a lot of the people that even two classes older than me, you know, maybe a year younger than him, they just hadn't played a lot because there were so many people in that senior class and they had all graduated. So it was our time as like to step into their role and to, you know, hopefully become champions. And, you know, being a 10th grader, I had seen all these championships over and over and over. I just thought like, yeah, we're going to be champions too, right? Um, and um, I, I definitely didn't want to be part of the class that didn't, become a champion and you know not to brag but we we were champions all four years that I was in high school too so um I, just uh that's that's a small thing and it doesn't matter at all and <laughs> but you know the reason I said that you know that becoming a champion that was really huge to me because I, I wanted that I wanted to know what it was like to to lift up a trophy you know to to have a letterman jacket like I've talked about that before you know and, and and have your name on it and just be a source of pride for my whole town because I'm from a really small town something that you know everybody took pride in and so we started with summer workouts you know that that's when it really hit me um, we would have like three a days we'd get up at 5 30 in the morning and work out then we'd have like an 11 o'clock practice and we'd have an evening practice and we'd kind of avoid the heat of the day in the afternoon but the morning workout was the worst thing to me because we'd start off at 5.30 in the morning. We'd start doing speed and agility drills to kind of get your body loosened up. Then we'd go lift weights. But then the end, we'd go run hills. And that was the worst because I'm not much of a runner. Um, it is just not, not my thing. And the way that we would run is it was like a mile and a half run to try to get our endurance up. But it was down, or I'm sorry, I'm trying to go with the camera. So it was down a hill and then back up another one and then back. So it was just a big V. And it was like on an incline like this. Like it was really steep. And so it was time too. And I remember it was the first day, and this is when this thought hit me, this is going to cost me more than anything because we started the run and I had no gas left in the tank. I was done. And I ran down the hill, came back up went down, started up towards the finish line, and I'm like 60 meters away from finishing in time. And I just started puking. Like, I just started throwing up, and I stopped, and I didn't make time. And as soon as I started throwing up, I had two coaches just screaming at me, just like, keep going, keep going. You know, like just, uh, it was like being in the military, I guess. It was just crazy. And... They made me actually do it again. And I remember that second time running it, I was like, man, this is going to cost me more than I ever thought. Like, I, I've never put in work like this. I've never worked this hard. I've never been pushed to this limit. And I think sometimes 
we do the same, we have the same kind of realization in our lives in our spiritual walk. Um, we get, you know, kind of so caught up in normal life or, or we've seen life done by others so much. We've gone to church our whole life or something like that. And we forget that our walk with God is about a personal relationship with God. We start thinking about all the stuff that we're doing, you know, whether it's good things like, hey, man, I'm, I'm doing missions, I'm, you know, whatever. And we start getting in this routine of doing things for God instead of doing things because of our relationship with God. And in this passage, I think we're going to see that hit David in a way and say, man, it needs to be about my personal relationship with God. We're going to see the ark. Um, remember, last time we've seen it before this was like 20 years ago in, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 6, timeline-wise, um, that the ark was in the house of Abinadab. What a hard name to say, Abinadab. But that's where um, the ark has been since 1 Samuel chapter 6. Now we're in 2 Samuel chapter 6. So this is like a, a whole book, you know, um, since, since that. And, you know, sometimes in our lives, we're like, you know what? We need to put God first. We think we know what that means. But today, my hope is that we'll see that putting God first in our lives means giving our all to God. Putting God first in our lives may be overwhelming at first, but because, or it may be overwhelming because if God is first by deduction, we're not. <laughs> so let's do this. Let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 6. We're going to read the first um, 15 verses. And then after that, we're going to look at four ways that we can put God first, or, or four Four statements that I think are just true about if we're going to put God first, what that means for us. So, 2 Samuel chapter 6, we're going to look at the first 15 verses. This is what it says in the word of the Lord. Sorry, my phone's going off. Let me turn that off. Um, sorry about that, guys. Picking up in verse 1. It says, then David again gathered all the elite troops in Israel, 30,000 in all. He led them to Baal, or Baal, Baal of Judah to bring back the Ark of God, which bears the name of the Lord of heaven's army, who is enthroned between the cherubim. And they placed the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it from Abinadad's house, which was on a hill. And that's a big thing that they put it on a new cart. Uzzah and Ao from Abinadad's house, which, I'm sorry, I lost my place. I'm messing up this morning reading. Uzzah and Ao, Abinadad's sons, were guiding the cart that carried the ark of God. Ao walked in front of the cart, and David and all the other people of Israel were celebrating before the Lord, singing songs and playing all kinds of musical instruments, lyres, harps, tambourines, cymbals, and cassonets. But when they arrived at the threshing floor of Nacon, the oxen stumbled, and Uzzah reached out with his hand and steadied the ark of God. And then the Lord's anger was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him dead because of this. So Uzzah died right there before the ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord's anger had burst out against Uzzah. And he named that place Perez Uzzah, which means to burst out against Uzzah. As it is still called to this day. And David was now afraid of the Lord. And he asked, how can I ever bring back the ark of the Lord back to, into my care? So David decided not to move the Ark of the Lord into the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom of Gath. And the Ark of the Lord remained there in Obed-Edom's house for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom's entire household. And then King David was told, The Lord has blessed Obed-Edom's household and everything he has because the Ark of God. So David went there and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom 
to the city of David with great celebration. And after the men who were carrying the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, David sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, wearing a priestly garment. So David and all the people of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts of joy and blowing a ram's horn. So that's the reading of God's word. But let's kind of work our way back through it and see what these four points are that I want to bring out. And the first one that we see in verses 1 and 2 is if we're going to put God first in our life, it means that you have to desire his presence. Think about David, where he is in his journey. Like we think about the big picture of his life. He went from obscurity in a field, right? Being a sheep herder. To now he's in this new capital. That's the city of David. You know, Zion. He even renamed it Zion. You know, this is my city. This is the capital city. I'm the king. So he goes from obscurity to kingship. You know, he goes from public enemy number one for 20 years running from Saul and being, you know, the number one most hunted person. He had to go live in a different country to being the king and unifying. Everybody loved him. So he went from the most hated to the most loved. That's insane. And he went from having Saul completely against him to nobody in Saul's house. You know, Steve talked about it on Thursday. Could even challenge him to his throne. He's completely unchallenged. Like, he is the king no matter what. And so this is where he's at. From the most hated, most obscure, to being the man. And he's on top of the world, right? Like, you, you would have to be on top of the world. Think about it if you were in that same thing. Like, you, you're the king. Um, everything's going right, it seems. But you're missing one thing. The presence of God, right? That's what he was missing. And that was the art. Um, and it's not like he forgot about God, but to make the kingdom complete and to truly be a ch- the chosen people of God, like that's what Israel is supposed to do, right? They're supposed to be God's chosen people in the world, to be a light to the world, a light to the nations, to bring them back to God. He needed to make Jerusalem not only the capital, but the religious capital. You know, David was creating a place where everyone could go to worship. He was centering life. Because if you think about a capital city, that's where all the business gets done, right? That's where all the laws get made. So he wants to make the religious thing the center thing so it permeates everything in their society. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to bring the glory of God out of obscurity in Abinadab's house into prominence in the life of all the Israelites. Not only that, you know, he does it three times a year through festival that they have to actually travel there. But we won't go down that rabbit hole. Like David is, he, that's what makes him such a good king is that's that's his focus. He says, God, I, I need you to be in every part of my life. Your presence has to be with us or we're nothing. He's making sure that people don't forget their mission and their purpose. And that's what I mean by saying that putting God first means that we need to have that desire in our hearts, that desire for God's presence in our lives, that God would permeate everything that it wouldn't be about us but it would be about him and that we depend on him and so i think that's what we see in the first two verses and the next thing is this that putting god first is done on god's terms and look at verses three through five david's pumped right he's he's kind of leading the band he's he's sitting there in verse five david and all the people were celebrating before the lord singing songs playing all kinds of musical instruments they're playing music. It's a party. He's got things going. He's wearing like this priestly garb. He's, he's getting everybody pumped. They're having a worship service that is huge. However, sometimes our best intentions can be misguided. Because what happens? Or Well, before we get there, let me just ask you this. You know, we've, we've all kind of done that, right? We've all had good intentions. Like, like, Maybe your wife or your girlfriend asks, um, do you think she's prettier than I am? Or do these pants make me look fat? And nope is always the answer to that. Like, no, you never want to answer yes to that. But, you know, you, you might say the wrong thing and you mess up. 
and we, you know, even though you have the right intentions in your mind, you you do something you know immediately, like this is wrong. Well, that's kind of what happens to David here. Um, is this, you know, he gets so wrapped up in this worship service that he forgets about what God had demanded them to do with the ark. God had created the ark to be carried by the Levites. And what do we see in verse 3? See that Uzzah and Ao, they made this fancy cart to carry it. And you know who Uzzah and Ao are not? They're not Levites. So there's two problems here. You know, they bring this new cart. I'm sure it was fancy. I'm sure David's like, yes, do that. I mean, think about how pumped David is for this. Not only did he have this massive worship service, but he brought 30,000 troops just to escort it. And they were his elite troops, it says. So he's it's crazy. Like he, He's like, nothing's going to stop this. We could be attacked by multiple nations. God's presence is going to the capital. But it's not what, I mean, that's not what happens, right? They're, the ark wasn't supposed to be carried by anything mechanical. And so what do they do? They bring in this new cart, and I'm sure they're thinking, like, yeah, that's, that's what we need to do. The problem is, it's not the assignment that they had. Why? Because the ark represented God's presence. That's what it was created for. Remember, God would sit in between the cherubim on top, the two um, figurines of angels. And the ark was supposed to be the burden of the Lord. And that burden was to be carried on the hearts and the shoulders of the Levites. That's, that's the symbol that you would see when they were carrying it. And so you might be, and when we see this, if you want to go back and, and check my sources, go back to Exodus 25, verses 12 through 15, and Numbers 4, 15. And that, that's where we see this. And what I'm trying to bring out here, if we truly care about putting God first, we will go to God before fitting him into our plans. Because we see David, he gets so wrapped up in this thing that he forgets about what God wanted him to do in the first place. And really, just think about how absurd that would be for us just to tell a perfect and holy God, hey, can you fit in our box so that we can worship you? Really, that's idolatry, right? Like, how much power do you have over anything? Like, think, like, could you walk out into a field and tell a flower, hey, can you stand up straight? No. Well, that's kind of like us telling God, I need you to be this way so I can worship you. We're creating an idol out of God. And if we want to put God first, we have to go to him and figure out what God's will is for us. So how do we do that? We go to his word, right? David easily could have consulted all the books of Moses. But also, at the same time, he's caught up in the pageantry. He's caught up in the music. That consumer-oriented culture. That's what we have in America when it comes to religion. Like I'll, It's like a little buffet line sometimes. People are like, well, I like God to be this way. I don't like when he does this, so we'll just cut that out. Um, and we, we, we make this idol out of what God is. But worship isn't about what pleases us. It's about what pleases us. And that's the most important thing. If we want to put God first, we have to realize that it has to be on his terms. It can't be on ours. Because worship isn't about us. It's about him. So putting, that's the second thing. And the third thing is this, and I think we see it in verses 6 and 7, is that putting God's first, putting God first means we will fail. Uzzah, what happens to him, right? He sticks out his hand to steady the ark, right? He takes hold of it. What did Numbers 4.15 say? It said, thou shalt not touch any holy thing lest they die. We read that and we're shocked, right? We're, we're like, why? That's pretty harsh, God. Like he was just trying to, to stop it from crashing. But Uzzah, in a rash moment, he thinks, and he's like, oh, I can do this. you know. And he does what's right in his own eyes. And I think it's important to bring out that 
even decisions in a rash moment, even these things that you don't really think about, they matter to God because they're, they're telltale signs of your heart. And I don't think Uzzah meant to do it in a bad way. You know, I don't, but he's in a bad position already because he's driving this cart, right? Like he's, he's on the cart that he wasn't even supposed to have. This was supposed to be carried by the Levites. So we think, how could God do this? But Uzzah was already in a bad situation. God shows up to this worship service in like the worst way, right? Like we see God's presence show up and we think like, yes, they're having this worship service, but what happens? Uzzah dies. Crazy. And the key is that Uzzah acted in reaction instead of realizing the situation. Uzzah erred in thinking it didn't matter who carried the ark. Uzzah erred in thinking it didn't matter how the ark was carried, right? So either who carried it or, or, or how it was, it didn't matter. He also erred in thinking that he knew all about the ark because it was in his father's house for so long. And he errs in, his, in thinking that the ground in Nikon's threshing floor was less holy than his own hands. And he says there's no difference between the ark or any other valuable object. That's really what's going through his mind. His intention was right, but his actions were wrong. And I think we can easily fall victim to this when we're trying to write our walk with the Lord. Like we start basing our actions. Like we're like, hey, we want God to be first in our lives, so we need to start changing all of these things. And we start basing all of our actions on what's right by our culture or by other standards instead of God's perfect standard. Like we don't go to God's word and say, God, what do you want from me? But we start looking around and we say, well, this is what everybody thinks is good. And this is what Uzzah did. He fails to understand that. And what happens? Like, we read this and we get outraged, right? We, but we all fail. And recognizing that is the cornerstone to our walk with Christ. Because if we start by judging our performance by anything but God's standard, we're worshiping God wrongly. Again, we're creating idolatry. And so putting God's first means realizing that we will fail and that we have failed. And that's why we need God. And the fourth thing is, is verse 8 through the rest of the chapter. And it, it is this, putting God first will offend you. J.D. Greer says this, he's one of my favorite pastors and theologians and all of those things. He's a pastor up in North Carolina. He says this, if you're reading the Bible and it doesn't offend you, then you're not reading the Bible. And what he means by this is the Bible is so countercultural to every culture that's ever existed. Everywhere in the Bible, God's demanding that you truly follow him, that you put the kingdom of God first. How many verses have you heard of first, put, put first the kingdom of God, right? Like it's all over the New Testament. It's a command. Jesus tells the rich young ruler, hey, sell everything and follow me. He tells his disciples that they'll have to hate their father and mother. Hate's a pretty strong word, right? What does Paul say? To die is gain. Those are, that's pretty intense. Jesus says, if they hate me, they will hate you. You're going to be offended by the Bible. Why? Because it's counter to what you want. Nothing in this book is about us. And that's the beautiful thing that the gospel is about him. So we see David come to understand this principle because he's angry, right? And he stops the caravan and he prays like, God, how could you do this? And he just leaves the ark in Obed-Edom. Then about three months later, he comes around to see that there's been nothing but blessing come from God's presence. And he sees Uzzah's good intentions, they weren't enough. Because God not only cares about our intentions, but he cares about our actions. And we see David, after three months, 
really come to realize this presence of God is not a, not a curse, but it's a blessing. When God's word is obeyed, as holiness respected, blessings follow. Curse and The curse and death of Uzo was not from God's heart, but from man's disobedience. And I think that's the thing. is We, we always look at circumstances and we say, how could God do this? But we're missing the fact that it's our disobedience that caused it. So we, we'll see tomorrow how excited and we'll see David's true joy when Richard um, finishes out this and I won't take anything from him. But we'll see David just elated. And how, how could he get past himself and see the glory of God and, and we're going to see how to truly worship God in spirit and truth. And I hope you realize that today, that Christianity isn't about perfectionism. It's not about us being perfect. It's not about our best intentions. It's about the glory of God. Because we couldn't live a perfect life. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The only reason there is Christianity is because Jesus Christ came and lived that perfect life for us. He died on the cross for us. So if we want to put God first in our lives, it isn't about our actions. It's about seeing God for who he is and being in awe of that. And the greatest news is this, that some of us have been pursuing God like David. We've gotten caught up in the spectacle of religion. We've just got caught up in the music and in the actions. We're dancing. We're playing guitar, whatever it is. And we just got caught up in it. And we didn't even realize that we've made this art and we've tried to surplant religion over God created this idol that we worship, but it's not God. And some of us have pursued God like Uzzah. We've been doing things. You know, it's all been about our actions. But maybe it, maybe it's not just that. Maybe it's we're doing things on our own terms. You know, hey, we think this is right. We've never even really looked at the Bible. The good news, and the good news of the gospel is no matter how much that offends you, is that Jesus took that curse for us. And all you have to do is see God for who he is. That's two words, our Savior. So I leave you with that. I hope that encourages you. I hope that brings you hope because that is hope. That is true hope. I want to thank you for being here. I'm going to close this with a word of prayer. We'll go out and have an awesome Saturday. But thank you again for being with us. Thank you for joining us as we've studied the Bible, as we've just journeyed through it. And then I hope that you see over all things today that it's not about us, it's about him and bringing glory to him. That's the main thing. So if you would bow your heads with me and I'll say a prayer and then we'll go out and have a good day. Dear Lord, we just thank you for today. We thank you for the fact that, God, you created us. Lord, that, that you created us, you sustain us, but God, more than all of that, you desire to have a relationship with us. You didn't just leave us here on the earth to our own demise, God, that, that you came, took human form. God, you became our substitute on the cross when we destroyed that relationship. God, we just praise your name for that, God. We, I pray that as we continue to look into your word, Lord, every day that, that, that you would open our eyes to you, God, that, that, that we would see you in a whole new way, that, Lord, that we would be able to worship you in fullness and truth. God, thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. Lord, thank you for sustaining us, God, the, the gift of life. Lord, I pray that you would be with our seafarer friends, Lord, no matter where they're at, whether they're on a ship now or... They're back at home, God, that, that, that you would show them that, that you are their sustainer. God, make your presence known in their life. And God, if somebody has listened to this today and said, I want to put God first in my life, God, give them grace. Because, Lord, we will fail. But, Lord, let them see you in a whole new way. In your name we pray. All right, thanks for being here. We'll see you tomorrow.